Welcome to Minister's Toolbox, providing leaders with the tools they need to succeed in ministry. Now, here's your host, Casey Sabella. Question. If you look at the failure or success of any relationship, church, or business, you could boil it all down to communication. Poor communication skills inevitably lead to a failure of leadership, marriage, or career. As church leaders, we are in the communication business, and this podcast is not going to try to teach you how to preach better. Check out episodes 37 or 74 if that's an interest. Instead, today I want to speak with you about ways you can communicate with your congregation. Wait, that sounds almost the same. Actually, it isn't. Join me for what I believe will be an eye-opening podcast. Back in a moment. Not too long ago, people came to church dressed in their Sunday best, said a dutiful hello to the greeter at the front door, and then received a mimeographed sheet of paper called a bulletin. Members would sit in their pews and scan the latest news and happenings coming up in the church. Once home, they would transfer those events to a calendar held on the refrigerator by a magnet or hanging from the wall. As technology improved, mimeographs morphed into inkjet and then laser printers, which produced color graphics to communicate the latest news to your congregation. Most churches continue with this tradition, never realizing it has become less and less effective as society has changed. How many times pastors have been frustrated by church members who fail to show up at a church event, only to be told they forgot or didn't read the bulletin? Even though our job is communicating God's word and purpose to his people, It is somewhat frustrating and astounding that pastors do such a poor job communicating what they think is imperative for church members to know and hear. Announcements play a crucial role in the spiritual development of people in your church. Even something as benign as a church picnic organizes members as a body who then get the opportunity to deepen genuine fellowship. Our methods to communicate are more the culprit than the information we're attempting to convey. Like it or not, and most of us don't like it, if you have served in ministry for more than 10 years, the way people access, consume, and respond to information is always changing. We can complain about it, try to keep up with it, or devise a strategy to respond to how people connect with what is essential. It is no mystery that all of us are regularly overloaded with information. People in your church are the same. The news cycle alone constantly invades our thinking and plans, not to mention social media in all forms. It is challenging to have a single meeting with anyone that is not interrupted by a text or phone call, and it has become commonplace for adults to sit around a kitchen table, not talking to each other, but accessing social media. Ironically, studies show that people are lonelier more now than ever, even though they have hundreds of friends and likes on Facebook. Anyway, this is not a tirade on technology, but just a reality check on the noise that captures the attention of everyone we serve in ministry. How can we as leaders better communicate information on upcoming events in a way that causes people to respond? I invited a group of young people out to discuss this dilemma, and even they struggled with the whole issue of announcements. By and large, people don't pay much attention to written bulletins anymore, unless they are incredibly bored. Save yourself some ink and think about other ways to communicate with your congregation. The age of the bulletin is past, unless your congregation is in their late 50s or early 60s. The other issue is that announcements during a church service are extremely interruptive. The worship team leads people with songs of praise and people are touched by the Holy Spirit. In some cases, people openly weep when the conscious presence of Christ visits, and people focus on him. A few moments later, someone ends the experience by saying, Next Tuesday night, we're holding a church-wide barbecue at Muzzy Field. Sign up at eatlikeapig.com. Announcements, more often than not, are like taking a large cold water hose and spraying the entire congregation. People awake from their previous sensitivity to the presence of God and ultimately learn that worship is a 20 or 30 minute song service 
that precedes preaching and nothing more. Is it any wonder that many congregants listen and watch the worship team rather than engage in active worship themselves? The key to all communication is speaking in a way so that the person or persons understand and respond. Today's church continues to speak in ways that do not match our current culture. Like it or not, technology has altered communication in both positive and negative ways. You can fight technology and probably have solid arguments. Meanwhile, few are listening, so there's that. Getting announcement information into the ears and minds of people in our church is challenging. We chose to make announcements part of our opening sequence with appropriate, attractive graphics. The advantage is that they no longer disturb the overall flow of the service. The disadvantage is, is that latecomers miss out. Many have wisely taken to Facebook or Instagram to promote upcoming events. I talk about social media in episode number two. I want to reemphasize <coughs> excuse me, that your church ought to have its own Facebook page. Please, please, Pastor, do not use your personal Facebook page to speak to your church members. It is really amateurish and of little interest to those who do not attend. Share announcements or church-related information on a church Facebook page. The audience liked the page as a choice, so are already interested in what's happening there. Have your media person utilize video and attractive graphics to invite people to upcoming events. If you're trying to reach the community with announcements designed to evangelize or bring them to your church, I have a warning. Facebook limits how and to whom you communicate with. For example, if you have 1,000 friends on your personal Facebook page and publish something, only about 50 of your friends see the message. That's the ugly reality. Facebook does not send your message to all 1,000 friends. And if you believe that, I have some swamp land in Florida that I'd like to sell you. Every two weeks, Facebook changes its algorithm. What does that mean? They use technology that identifies what might be of interest to each individual based on their online patterns and in split seconds decides who gets what message when. I always find it amusing when some people post a challenge to respond to their Facebook post by saying, I just want to find out who's reading my posts. The reality is only people Facebook chooses per day per message that the algorithm thinks it might help or inform. Now, churches can change this immediately by spending money, and there's the dirty little secret. If you're going to use Facebook to communicate, you will have to factor a certain amount of cash into the budget each week. Then you can control who and how many get your message. The cost is inexpensive rel relative to other advertising, but do not fool yourself into thinking that your unpaid announcements reach everyone in your church and beyond. They do not. You might say that isn't fair, and you're right, but it is not your platform. Facebook owns it, and you are playing on their property, or as some have said, you're playing in their sandbox, and they make the rules. Believe it or not, one of the most effective ways to communicate announcements on upcoming events is through a tried and true method that many say is outdated. It's called email. What? Email? Isn't that old hat? Yes, it is, but the beautiful thing about email is that you can control who gets it without interruption. Your challenge is to make the subject line so compelling that people want to open your email. If you send out a church email that says, Church announcements this week, expect many to delete it. If you send out the same email with a subject line that says, You won't believe what is happening at Lifesong Church this week more people will open the email to find out. There are paid services that focus on weekly communication and follow-up for newcomers to your church. One that I found useful is Text in Church, which automates texts and emails to new people over six weeks. I'll have a link in the show notes at ministerstoolbox.com for you to investigate if you're interested. The point in all this is that many leaders get frustrated when their congregants fail to come to a special meeting or outing and then conclude that they're just uncommitted to the work of Christ. That may or may not be accurate. But I can tell you from experience, many times we are using old systems to communicate 
to people in a noisy world, and our messages are just not breaking through. I encourage you to speak with your leadership team and ask them what they think would be more effective in communicating your announcements or important messages. Announcements are really critical because more often than not, they are created to get people more involved in the work of ministry. You know as a leader that Sunday morning sermons cannot develop disciples, and effective communication via announcements move people in the right direction. We have to adapt to our culture if we expect to reach them effectively. We never change our principles, but must always change our methods. So, let's sum up what we've been talking about. Number one, effective communication is the lifeblood of your church. Number two, create events that either outreach to your community or strengthen bonds between church members. Discipleship is based entirely upon a relationship. Number three, use Facebook wisely. Remember, it's not your sandbox, so don't think you will effectively reach people outside your church without spending money. It isn't going to happen. But it can be advertising money well spent. Number four, give thought to when and how you make announcements in church. Consider moving them to the very beginning or end of a service, and think about dumping the bulletins unless your congregation is primarily Medicare age. Number five, rediscover a midweek email as another way to communicate either information or what's on your mind. To increase the likelihood of getting your email read, make sure the subject line is interesting, or it asks a question, or talks about what creates interest. Before I go, I want to take some time to share with you a brief update on my recent trip to Zimbabwe. First, thank you to those who have prayed for or financially supported our project, Wells for Zimbabwe. I was privileged to visit the site where our first well is installed and operating. People from miles around are ecstatic to have fresh water, where formerly they had to walk up to five miles just to collect a bucket of water and carry it back home on their heads. As we dedicated the well to the Lord and the community, Several officials gave their lives to Jesus Christ. Very powerful. I posted many pictures on Instagram under Zim underscore Wells. But go to the show notes at ministerstoolbox.com to hear an amazing testimony about the day our well finally reached water. It will bless your heart. While there, I was also privileged to connect with Foundations for Farming and began an alliance that will help our well project train area people to farm the lands adjacent to the well, and what will increase their yield 16 times more than other farms in the region. Too much to tell on a brief podcast, but Lord willing, I will be creating a more detailed video in the weeks and months ahead to lay out our vision and plans for the future. Short term, many more wells are needed, and at the cost of nine to $12,000 each, I'm making plans to create a foundation that will accelerate this project while keeping our gospel message and purpose clear and on track. My plans are to return to Zimbabwe next year as the Lord allows. My first book, Spiritual Abuse, How to Break Free from Toxic Churches Without Losing Your Faith, is doing well. I'm lining up interviews on other podcasts, and you can learn more at ministerstoolbox.com or caseysabella.com. I will be sharing excerpts from my newest book, Minister's Toolbox, next week. Until then, I always end with a quote especially for you. This one appropriately is from George Bernard Shaw, who wisely said, The single biggest problem in communication is the illusion that it has taken place. <laughs>